Abat le ciel. I emphasize that you're starting from a blank canvas. I emphasize the meaninglessness of the exercise, and yet something meaningful arises from it that we cannot evaluate in terms of this phony pain pleasure calculus. What does it mean to apply the pain pleasure calculus to any of these things? To apply it to thousands of hours studying Chinese to say, oh well, is there more pleasure than there is pain? It's meaningless. It's it's a it's a categorical error. You're putting something in the wrong category. It's this is not like BDSM. This is not something we can look at how much pain is caused versus how much pleasure and come to a conclusion. The merit or value of studying Chinese is it's not going to be quantified in this way. The merit or value of going and doing humanitarian work who, for whom are you even going to add up the, the pain and pleasure? It makes no sense. Part of this delusion stems out of starting from the deep-seated assumption that the meaning of life is pleasure and that suffering is something so terrible that it negates any possible or actual meaning in life. So here's, a, here's an example. The large parts of the universe that are uninhabited, uh, there aren't beings there, uh, certainly not sentient beings. And if we think about those uninhabited parts of the, of the universe, we're not filled with, and nor do I think we should be filled with remorse for the absent goods that there are there. So if we think about Mars, for example, where there could be Martians, but they aren't, uh, we don't think, gee, think about all that pleasure that those absent Martians uh, could have. Isn't that a terrible thing? We don't think that at all. Um, whereas, think if we think about the absence of, let's say, Martian wars, uh, just like we have wars on Earth, and we think about the absence of all the suffering there, I think we'd say that's a pretty good thing. It's pretty good that they don't have that there, that there's, that there's nothing like that on Mars. That's, a, that's an advantage that Mars has over Earth. But there's no one who doesn't have those harms. Exactly, exactly. But uh, I still think that it's a, it's a good thing that there's the absence of that suffering on Mars. The idea of a numerical form of suffering is totally unreal. That's an abstraction, and it's an abstract comparison that is uh, profoundly misleading in the same way that a monotheist paradise is, right? So there are people who, who say, this is, I'll, I'll use a very down-to-earth example here. You can talk to Jews, Christians, and Muslims who will say to you, well, yes, you may enjoy having sex outside of marriage. You may enjoy fornication in the strictest biblical sense of fornication. But what you don't realize is that this is really not very much pleasure, and it's going to involve a certain amount of suffering and sorrow and agony. And uh, how can you possibly compare that to paradise in the afterlife? How can you compare that to what you're passing up, this imaginary afterlife, this heaven, and so on that ensues, for without that much of a difference for uh, Christians, Muslims, and, and, and Jews? Uh, how can you destroy one for the other? I mean, but this is even more absurd because we're not making a comparison between Earth and an imaginary paradise. We're making a, a comparison between Earth and a nullity, an imaginary non-entity, which is life as it exists now on the surface of the moon. Let's spend a moment on that. If I posit a kind of godlike paradise for all conscious beings, right? So there really is just... There's nothing wrong in the universe by any, anything that you can say is wrong. You know, like there's a little ache and pain over here. There's a little dissatisfaction over here. I will just cancel that by saying, no, no, these, those are moments where there's, there's more pleasure flooding in there and more, uh, an even deeper sense of meaning, even deeper gratification of one's intellectual life. And these are, these are beings who are, far more competent than you and I are to judge the character of their experience. They've had a billion years to consider the matter, and they're still happy to be here. Imagine minds constituted like that. Why should we be indifferent to that and the primordial dial tone of non-existing? See, I think what's dividing us here is the asymmetry, because if you, if you think there is the asymmetry that I'm, uh, that I'm defending, then you'll say, well, there's nothing bad in that Edenic life that you're speaking about, but there's also nothing bad in the situation of non-existence. So uh, that, they're, 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 they're equal. What's going on here invisibly for the, the antinatalists is actually a monotheistic, salvific mode of thinking. 
the paradise of the antinatalists is the moon. It's the lifeless rocks on the surface of Mars, as surreal as that may sound. And they're saying, compared to that standard, what we do here on Earth can never live up to it. So why paint a picture? Why study a language like Chinese? Why do humanitarian work when it can't compare to this paradise they're holding up as, as an abstract comparison? But that comparison is utterly unreal. And in contrast to that, the value of this painting is actually something very real. <laughs> Hey guys, what's up? This video is going to get into some of the profoundest questions of the meaning of life, philosophy and praxis, etc. Uh, but it does so jumping off from some of the simplest and shallowest questions that are entertained by antinatalists, including what I would call uh, extremist YouTube attention-seeking antinatalists like in Mendham, somebody who I've, I've crossed swords with in debate here on YouTube in the past. In the background, you can see and possibly uh, hear my girlfriend, uh, Melissa, who is uh, rolling out the dough. You're making bread or something, huh, babe? I make pita bread. Okay, pita bread today. All right, we're doing a lot of baking lately, and you can see the outline of my uh, my robot friend, as I call it, the stand mixer we own, and some other, some other kitchen equipment was uh, among our top priorities when we first moved into this apartment. So, look guys, this video began with a question from a supporter on Patreon. If you want to pay $1 a month, you can send me questions and I'll send you replies. And if your questions or the discussion is intelligent enough, I'll make videos in response to your question just like this one. A guy wrote in to me very, very sincerely overwrought over the ethical and philosophical issues raised by the antinatalists. Now, Melissa, in the background, she had a period of her life where those questions meant a lot to her. I think not these same philosophical questions, but the questions raised by child-free people and antinatalist people on the internet, you know, I mean, there's a reason why this is meaningful to millions of people. It, it raises questions of how should we live? What does it mean to live a good life? How should we, as thinking, intelligent adults, resolve to spend the rest of our days? Should we or should we not be, you know, resolving to spend our time raising an infant? as opposed to doing the various positive things we can do. Is it, in fact, net positive or net negative? Is it something selfish that subtracts from the world to decide to, to have your own child? Or is it something positive that adds to the world? This is, not, um, this is not a shallow or simple question. And it's something I know Melissa thought about a great deal before she fell in love with me and basically went baby crazy. But hey, <laughs> wait, sorry, I'm, not, I'm, I'm joking around. But her position, her position on this is not shallow, but it is true that when she fell in love with me, she had a period of really being baby crazy, which was interesting to see where I think uh, hormones <laughs> and the romantic instinct totally overwhelmed what were, I think, genuinely several years of, of deep uh, meditations and reflections that you were. Anyway, look, I got a sincere question on Patreon from a guy who was really uh, overwrought, not just about the antinatalist critique as applied to individual people getting pregnant, having babies, those decisions, but in the broader ecological worldview that uh, sort of step one is the antinatalists arguing that human beings do so much damage to the world that it would be better for the planet in an abstract sense if human beings didn't exist or if there were fewer and fewer human beings ultimately leading to the, the termination of, of the human species on Earth. That's one angle to it. But then I think the, the necessary uh, kind of ethical and intellectual corollary of that, what inevitably follows from this, this perspective, is the view that all life is similarly deeply flawed. So I've heard in Mentum, who's a, a YouTuber of this philosophical school of thought, stating in almost exactly these terms, he, he has said that it's, it's a mistake for antinatalists to argue that only human life is flawed and suffering and bad. Uh, it's, it's a mistake, he says, to think that lions are doing it right, that sharks are doing it right, and that humans are doing it wrong. So th the point is here, if you think that human beings with their uh, intellect and their uh, neurosis and their agonizing over ethical and philosophical choices, if you think our lives are not worth living, how much less worthwhile is the endless toil, struggle, and aimless suffering of a lion in the wilderness, of a squirrel in the forest, of a shark in the ocean, of a penguin plodding around in circles 
on the uh, ice shelf of Antarctica. So the same fundamental pessimism, which I think in this, in this video I'm going to argue very briefly, arises from a, a very simple error. But the, the fundamental perspective or delusion that life itself cannot be justified because of the pleasure-pain calculus. That when you add up the suffering of the life of that penguin or the life of that lion, it's so much greater than the pleasure that therefore it would be better if the penguin didn't exist, if the lion didn't exist, if all human life and human endeavor didn't exist. Now, in response to this Patreon supporter writing to me, and as he was very sincere, he talked about his own life and what he's been struggling with and what he's been thinking about in this respect. I mean, this wasn't, wasn't a kind of hypothetical debating club situation or something. This is something that's really impacted his life and his perspective. Um, I pointed out that the real moral judgment here is that life on the moon is better than life on Earth, by which I mean no life at all. I said I might call this philosophy not antinatalism and not pessimism, it might be called lunarism. Because ultimately the conclusion is that a lifeless rock circling around the sun is more meaningful than a rock on which there is life, ecology, forests, oceans, and the suffering that comes with it. That the existence of a nervous system and perceptual organs like eyes and ears that are capable of suffering is something so terrible, is such a mistake in this judgment that it's so wrong and so bad that the universe would be a better place. It would be morally, ethically, and sensually superior. I say sensually because this comes down to sensations in this bizarre sense in terms of the, the pleasure-paying calculus. It would be better if our solar system were just a series of lifeless asteroids or barren surfaces like the moon. So this conversation with this guy proceeded further, and it, it again had a positive impact on him. He mentioned that another one of my philosophical discussions really impacted him positively, um, where I talk about the difference between perceiving the world in terms of minimizing your ecological impact, minimizing the negative impact, as opposed to maximizing your, your positive impacts, which is you know a conceptual difference in how you think about your own life. may not be any actual difference in terms of what you do in your life, but it's a different way of, of, of drawing up the calculus. And I say part of this delusion stems out of starting from the deep-seated assumption that the meaning of life is pleasure, and that suffering is something so terrible that it negates any possible or actual meaning in life. That simply the existence of suffering negates the existence of the whole ocean. That there's no point having an ocean with sharks and whales in it if there's going to be suffering. If those sharks are going to eat fish, I don't know, maybe the whales eat the sharks sometimes. Depends on which species of whale we're talking about, etc., etc. The, um, the cycle of life is lacking a justification because in their minds the only justification that can exist is of pleasure outweighing pain. And I think that is a, a, a fundamentally incoherent and nonsensical view of the universe, view of ecology, view of the life of the squirrel and the lion in the, in the forest, and it's especially nonsensical when it's, when it's applied to human beings. Now, uh, starting, of course, the selection of examples is significant here. And I'm going to put forward later here in this video an example that doesn't flatter my case. But I start with three examples really rapidly that do flatter my case. You can see where I'm coming from, where I'm going. Uh, humanitarian work. Painting on a blank canvas. Practicing Chinese as a language. I woke up this morning. I woke up uh, you know, about an hour before my girlfriend. And I started studying Chinese and listening to philosophy at the same time. Writing out senses in this language. I am not going to glorify for you. I'm the last person in the world to tell you that this is an intrinsically meaningful use of my time. Uh, the Chinese language is in many ways shockingly, painfully meaningless. And I don't lie to myself or others that this is something very meaningful. The meaninglessness of it is, you know, it keeps your teeth clean. <laughs> it's like, you know, rinsing out your mouth with rubbing alcohol or something. I mean, it's, it's brisk how meaningless it is to wake up and study these monosyllables and these, um, you know, symbols that started off with human beings scratching into tortoise shell and bone and, uh, you know, trying to make little ideographic, you know, depictions of, you know, two hands, a hand holding the, the moon and this kind of thing. Sorry, I have other videos talking about the, the Chinese written language. It's produced this legacy of incredibly complex and yet 
meaningless symbols that I'm now expected to spend the next 10 years of my life doing rote memorization for, for a very uncertain outcome. I mean, the ultimate outcome of that after 10 years is that I will never speak, read, or write Chinese as well as a native speaker does, and what I can do with the language in my own life may also be meaningless, etc. Okay? So my point is here, in a Buddhist sense of the word suffering, I'm willing to see this kind of intellectual exercise, study, education, self-development, as suffering, and even as meaningless suffering, right? And yet, I still think it is radically false to look at this and say, wow, what's going on right now on the surface of the moon is superior. That, you know, this is, it would be better if uh, life on Earth resembled life on Mars or life on the, on the moon. That, gee, if only we could, we could get rid of the obstruction of all this biological and intellectual complexity that would be better. With humanitarian work, again, I would not glorify someone going into doing humanitarian work. I'm not going to tell you that it's inherently meaningful. I'm not going to tell you you can even have any reliable sense of positive outcomes if right now you sign up to do humanitarian work in Syria. But the, the real contrast we have to make in our lives is not between you buying an airplane ticket, going to Syria, and let's say, say handing sacks of rice to starving people, handing bandages to people who need medical care. Let's just say it's the most direct. Let's say you actually build a shelter for refugees, temporary camps, and this kind of thing uh, uh, in the borderlands of, of Syria. You're providing material needs for people in the most, the most simple sense. Um, it, it would be ridiculous and absurd to contrast that to the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars and say, well, look look how much more simple it is without any of this suffering, without any of this striving, without any of this ambition to do something positive. Isn't it morally superior to, to move to Mars or for Earth to wipe out human life? Now, there are contrasts that are important. You can do this. You can sign up and, and go to Syria, or uh, you can watch basketball. What was it, babe? They just did the Final Four or something in basketball? I don't know anything about basketball. Yeah. The NCAA championships just just happened in in basketball. I've I've never even heard of this crap. You know, I'm I'm spending my time studying Chinese. We're actually reading Plato and Socrates and Xenophon. We're doing meaningful things, and we're baking. We're baking bread every day. We're doing meaningful things with our time. The real contrasts we have to deal with in life are not between the surface of the moon and the surface of planet Earth, but they are contrasts between the type of meaninglessness, the type of suffering involved in devoting your time to watching basketball as opposed to the type of meaninglessness or the type of suffering involved in attempting to do something positive to humanitarian work. And again, I don't glorify it. You have to watch other videos on this channel because I don't want to go into detail. I'm not here handing over. The same way it would be so easy for me to hand you the delusion, oh, studying the Chinese language is the most meaningful and rewarding thing in the world. Oh, going and helping the poor and downtrodden and the homeless is the most meaningful and rewarding thing in the world. I'm not offering that at all. I do see... The, the, the suffering and the meaninglessness and the inevitable disappointment and probably the ingratitude of the people you're helping and quite possibly at the end of doing the humanitarian work, you're left with a sense of hollowness and defeat and disappointment yourself and then maybe you want to go home and become a painter and start painting canvases about it. So look, the canvas, again, um, to, to, to paint a picture, uh, I emphasize that you're starting from a blank canvas. I emphasize the meaninglessness of the exercise, and yet something meaningful arises from it that we cannot evaluate in terms of this phony pain-pleasure calculus. What does it mean to apply the pain-pleasure calculus to any of these things? To apply it to thousands of hours studying Chinese, to say, oh, well, is there more pleasure than there is pain? It's meaningless. It's, it's, a, it's a categorical error. You're putting something in the wrong category. It's, this is not like BDSM. This is not something where you can look at how much pain is caused versus how much pleasure and come to a conclusion. The merit or value of studying Chinese is it's not going to be quantified in this way. The merit or value of going and doing humanitarian work, who, for whom are you even going to add up the, the pain and pleasure? It makes no sense. The difference between having a blank canvas and painting a canvas, painting some meaningful image on this canvas, we cannot quantify in terms of pain versus pleasure. And I point out, the canvas itself, painting on a canvas, is real. Whereas this concept of there being a quantifiable thing called pain and a quantifiable thing called pleasure, 
The idea of a numerical form of suffering is totally unreal. That's an abstraction, and it's an abstract comparison that is uh, profoundly misleading in the same way that a monotheist paradise is, right? So there are people who, who say, this is, I'll, I'll use a very down-to-earth example here. You can talk to Jews, Christians, and Muslims who will say to you, well, yes, you may enjoy having sex outside of marriage. You may enjoy fornication in the strictest biblical sense of fornication. But what you don't realize is that this is really not very much pleasure, and it's going to involve a certain amount of suffering and sorrow and agony. And uh, how can you possibly compare that to paradise in the afterlife? How can you compare that to what you're passing up, this imaginary afterlife, this heaven, and so on that ensues, for without that much of a difference for uh, Christians, Muslims, and, and, and Jews? Uh, how can you destroy one for the other? I mean, but this is even more absurd because we're not making a comparison between Earth and an imaginary paradise. We're making a, a comparison between earth and a nullity an imaginary non-entity which is life as it exists now on the surface of the moon and, and mars uh the canvas itself is real we think of the arts and we think of image making you know artifice we think of creating uh, an illustration as something unreal as a mere appearance but in this case it's interesting because that image and what it means is something infinitely more real than this idea about a quantifiable form of suffering and pain. Um, what am I going to paint on the canvas? Okay, I've just been studying Chinese, and then I went to Syria and did humanitarian work, and uh, let's say, because I know a guy who's been doing humanitarian work over there in the Syrian area, let's say I'm also interested in boxing. I'm not, but this guy I'm thinking of is. I think he's still a supporter of mine on Patreon. <laughs> anyway, I know a guy, and those are his interests. He's studying languages. I think he's studying Arabic, he's into boxing, and he's doing humanitarian work. So let's just say he sits down to the canvas and he puts together those feelings and experiences on a canvas. He paints a picture and there are elements of training to be a boxer and there are things that are related to studying the language and there's uh, some kind of pastiche reflecting his aspirations to help people and do humanitarian work and his disappointment and struggles with bureaucracy. There are all kinds of themes played on on this, on this canvas. All right, And the canvas begins with you know a blank empty white fabric there's nothing else there in a sense and yet there's so much there there's a process of painting that's meaningful for the painter there's a meaning that we perceive as being in the image intrinsic to the image or arising from the image that can mean something for the viewer for the audience right uh there's a social function and a cultural function even a political function to this to this canvas there's uh, a lot more real value here going on that cannot be analyzed in terms of pain and cannot be analyzed in terms of pleasure. Maybe none of it is pleasure. The actual process of painting may not be enjoyable. The actual process of looking at this painting and reflecting on the themes of war and starvation and medical assistance and boxing or whatever's on this guy's mind... It may not be pleasant either. <laughs> Maybe at no stage in this is there pleasure, and yet we're talking about something meaningful and something that belongs in a completely separate category from these questions of sharks and whales in the ocean, these questions of the life of the lion on the plains, these questions of, of what's meaningful and meaningless in human life, whether or not it was a mistake to be born or whether or not it's a mistake to give birth to a, another child today. I think we're actually conflating several different categories. And it, it, what's going on here invisibly for the, the antinatalists is actually a monotheistic, salvific mode of thinking. The paradise of the antinatalists is the moon. It's the lifeless rocks on the surface of Mars, as surreal as that may sound. And they're saying, compared to that standard, what we do here on Earth can never live up to it. So why paint a picture? Why study a language like Chinese? Why do humanitarian work when it can't compare to this paradise they're holding up as, as an abstract comparison? But that comparison is utterly unreal. And in contrast to that, the value of this painting is actually something very real, even though we may think of the arts as illusory. Abat le ciel.